In today's latest news, we have some big updates around Pochettino as we get ready now for his imminent appointment. We talk Frank Lampard sharing his thoughts and insights behind what we must do as a football club to move on and progress. And to follow on from this, we talk summer transfer targets with Yusuf Afano of Monaco being of interest. Could we make another move for Rafina of Barcelona and AC Milan are interested in Ruben Loftus cheek? So right now, my friends, we've got a ton of things to break down and discuss. The summer window is fast approaching. The season is coming to an end and hopefully our new manager is getting sorted by the end of this week. So hit that like button if you're excited for better things to come. Let's get 2k likes and without wasting any more time. So right now, let's kick things off and let's talk the latest news behind Pochettino. Now this weekend, Todd Bowley at like Bali, they were both spotted in LA holding more discussions over Pochettino. Now I guess we've all seen that clip of Iqbali and his son attending that basketball game and when asked about Pochettino being our new manager, we got some cryptic indications that yes, it's looking like a very strong possibility at this point in time. As we do know, Pochettino is continuing negotiations with his agents and currently he does have some nice leverage and he does have a strong negotiating position right now. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to get like good money. I'm sure he's going to get a very nice contract, but it's more about assurances and those insurances are going to include things like his full trusted backroom staff coming back with him, which is very key. And of course, the ability to influence the culture at this football club. Now, we have some early indications behind what this could possibly look like. And we do know that Pochettino wants to put more emphasis on homegrown talents. He wants to rely more upon young players. He wants to rely more upon using wingers to bring width in the team. Similar to how he used guys like Son, Lucas Moura, plus many more during his time at Tottenham. And for me, it's nice to know that he does care about using the youth at this club because that's why we're spending so much money on them. He absolutely loves Levi Cole. He sees them in his plans for next season. And stuff like this gives me some reassurance personally because, you know, the top, top talents must have pathways into the first team. It's common sense. And Pochettino has tons of experience blooding in young guys and coaching and developing them to become the foundations and the spine of his teams. And I think that's what we're lacking right now. A proper spine that can really just bring that continuity and to bring that safety for new signings as well too. Now we should see Pochettino attending tonight's game against Arsenal so all eyes are going to be on him and hopefully based on reports it seems like a deal for Port should finally be completed by the end of this week. So let's see how things play out. Now this story kind of segues in nicely to the next story now and let's discuss Frank Lampard and you know to start with things you know, Lampard seemed to be quite supportive of our move for Pochettino by saying that, you know, what the board is doing right now is the right thing. You know, taking their time to make sure they're finding the best possible candidate. That is what has to be done right now. And it seemed like, based on his press interview as well too, Lampard is saying, listen, I am here as an interim. I'm not here thinking I'm going to do anything more than that. I'm here to just safeguard the team until the season ends because currently, no manager would sign for us right now before the season ends. And... It makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you're a new manager, I mean, any manager, you don't want to be undermined. If you come and sign for us in the summer window where you have a pre-season, you're going to sign the players that you want. You're going to be able to sell and cut down the squad dramatically as well too. Most of the issues that managers have faced this season won't be a thing for you from next season. So it makes a lot of sense. And currently over the past week, a lot of managers and experienced figures in the game have been giving their opinions on our season and why it's been such a calamity or why it's been so bad. You know, recently uh, Jurgen Klopp coming out saying obvious things like, if you have a massive squad this big, essentially it feels like you have two separate teams that are draining in the same training grounds. That is not an ideal way to build relationships tactically, uh, on the field, etc, etc. There's too much separation behind the scenes. I think it's quite obvious. I feel like a lot of us can kind of understand this too. If you played any type of form of football, not even like for a club, but even just like Sunday League as well too. I mean, come on. On the ground level, working in an environment like this, you're not going to be able to do your best work and players for sure won't be playing their best football. But Lampard went on to state too so that he felt like during his very successful period at this football club that we probably could have won even more titles and trophies. He felt like he should have had at least five or six uh, Premier League titles under his belt. And the large issue as to why this was never the case was based on the fact that we were constantly swapping and changing managers. 
And I'd have to say, you know, I definitely agree. And I think the most egregious sacking I think I've seen on the Roman's era was the sacking of Ancelotti. Because for what he did for us in this first season winning the double, he's the type of guy where even if you kind of fall off a little bit the following season, you don't just easily replace him, you let him rebuild again. Because we play great football, the players love playing for him. And we did that common thing under the old ownership of, you know, signing players that the manager doesn't need. I mean, Fernando Torres was a tactical headache for Ancelotti. And I remember how we got knocked out of the Champions League against Man United and every other tournament because we kept forcing this way of playing that didn't suit what we already had. So I get frank in those regards, but I guess one thing I haven't really understood personally about Lampard at times are some of the tactical decisions. Now, I understand why we approached the game we did against Real Madrid. We had to compete. And that lineup he picked allowed us to compete, not win. That's a different thing, but to be able to compete, to try and win at least. And who knows what happens if Kukurera and others maybe take their opportunities, you don't know. But Lampard came out today and he did set some records straight. And I thought it was quite interesting to talk about. He said, ideally, he'd prefer to be playing attacking, free-flowing football. But based on the context of this season and the players he's working with right now, that's a very hard thing to get done right now. He seemed to allude to the fact that there are other areas of concern that needs to be addressed as well too. You know, with him mentioning things like our fitness levels to really be able to compete, press her up the field and win our battles. That's not of the required level that it should be to be able to play that type of attack in football. But he went back to saying that ideally he preferred to be playing free flow and attack in football during his first spell here. You know, we ranked very high for expected goals and we ranked quite low for expected goals conceded, but we still ended up losing games and conceding and that was still an issue but the thing is we don't even really have those foundations in place for me to even try and do that again and at the time I was criticized for us being maybe a bit too open he said that right now it kind of feels like he's putting pieces in the puzzle to try and make sense of what he's doing right now which I understand and it does go back to how managers be undermined working with too much talent too many players too much everything so that's the manager stuff out the way let's now discuss some transfer targets for the following season let's start with the first target and let's talk Yusuf Fofana of Monaco now I know that a lot of us really saw Fofana even more during the World Cup and personally for me I think he impressed and I think it was his game versus Morocco which really impressed me because you know I do kind of feel like when you play more defensive positions you can't necessarily judge them solely on what they're doing with the ball because what guys in these roles are doing off the ball is even more important for the sake of keeping the team together and making us strong defensively. And I think Fofana displayed a lot of good qualities off the ball in terms of the tactical intelligence, defensive positioning, etc, etc. That tells me that, yeah, this guy can probably play at a higher level now. Regardless, it was revealed that he is another option being looked at as a CDM for next season. And he is part of the list alongside guys like Romeo Lavia, Manu Kone, Declan Rice, Casado, etc etc now he currently has two years left on his deal which means that if you want to buy him this is the perfect time to buy him right now and in terms of his profile he is that dm slash boarding midfield player that supplies the more creative player alongside him you know that's the type of complementary midfield that he makes sense of that he does best in i thought him and shemeni were very good and he has a, a pretty decent one with kamara of monaco this season now as i said it's how he thinks and how he operates off the ball which for me really impresses me because that's what a dm should be doing you know facilitating the more creative uh, teammates around you and he's the type of guy that reads opponents moves very well he knows when to trigger his press he's not a headless chicken you know he's always in a, a great position to close off angles to add more support to the fullback if they need it etc etc and he finds himself in great positions to disrupt the opposition's game and he is a very competitive type of guy he wins a lot of his tackles and he's not necessarily giving away tons of silly fouls too which is one thing i always look for i hate these types of a defensive mid to constantly put the team under pressure by giving silly fouls away. Now that sense of danger, knowing when to uh, you know, create the overload for your teammates to like nullify a threat in front of you, these things are key and he has demonstrated that and this is why Deschamps ended up using him in the World Cup for very good reason. But I would say this though, just because he's part of the target list doesn't mean he's a main favorite, but I think he would be like a shrewd, interesting type of buyer. But again, unless we flop for all the other guys that we really want, I don't think Fafan would be necessarily bad backup. But in my opinion, I wouldn't mind my CDM being a bit 
taller, maybe being a little bit more physical for the Premier League. That's only my thing. So let's move on to other news. So let's move on and let's discuss this news around Rafina because it has actually been around for like over a month right now. And so give you guys the context. We know that Barcelona must dramatically reduce their wage bill. There's no more economic levers they can turn to now to free up more space in their wage bill. And it seems like they must set at least maybe one or two pretty decent first team level players to have that flexibility now in the market with names like De Jong and now Rafina being options looked at that could be sold. Now in the case of Rafina, it's not like Barcelona are putting him in the transfer list. Absolutely not. It's the fact that he could generate a ton of money if interested parties made moves and offers, most notably being us. Rafina's player cost for Barcelona is around 25 million. So that includes the 12.5 million a year they owe uh, to Leeds, of course, because when they bought him for around 60 million, they spread the costs out over five years. And on top of that, he has his wages as well too, which add up to around 25 mil. So ideally, because he has four years left on his deal at 25 million, Barcelona want 100 million euros to sell Rafina, which isn't necessarily too crazy based on the fact that Rafina had a pretty decent first year at Barcelona. Now, of course, he had some difficulties at times. I mean, you're playing at a high level now, new teammates, new environment, you need to take your time, new league. But as the season was going on, he was showing his influence, especially when Dembele was out with injuries. So he got around like, I think 10 goals and 11 assists, which is a you know a really decent record for his first season at Barcelona. He's shown that's a lot more to come from him. And now that it looks like he's probably set to win La Liga now with Barcelona, could he be more open to returning back to the Premier League knowing that he's now completed like a childhood dream because Barca might have to sell? Who knows? Uh, regardless, so I think if we see any more attacking additions, it's going to really just emphasize we're really looking to sell a ton of our attacking options now to revamp our attack. And I think that Rafina playing as a wide winger where he's one of those guys, but yeah, you can cut inside and do that, that ZH creativity. But I think what makes him a bit better is that if he's slightly deeper, he can also carry the ball further forwards. He can also attack his man, go on the outside, go on the inside. But I think if you give this guy like a proper overlapping fullback, he'll be even better. And I don't know, I think this Rafinha thing would be interesting. I think that when stories like this kind of start out so innocently from nowhere, they end up meaning something down the line. We just can't see it right now. So this is why I'm talking about things. Who knows what's going to happen with Rafinha? Who knows what's going to happen as the window goes on? But it does seem like there could be like some slight interest in returning back for him. Now that Barcelona potentially seem open to sales to reduce their wage bills. So you share your thoughts and opinions. Would a move like this piss you off? Or if more attacking guys were sold, could making another move for Rafinha now make a bit more sense? Right now, we end things by discussing Loftus Cheek because AC Milan seems to really want to sign him now in the summer. Now, as the season was starting, reports were coming out that Milan were really impressed by Ruben's performances against them when he played them twice in the group stages because... I thought he was very dominant against Denali and Benesar and, and they're like Milan's best midfield. So if like our squad guy is kind of outperforming their best midfields, it does kind of show you what the levels are in my opinion. But it seems like Milan are hoping to come back in now and make a 20 to 25 million euro offer to sign Loftus Cheek. But it does depend on the player being ready to leave us to sign for them. It'll be a very interesting development. Let's see what happens. Ruben has a ton of interest in Serie A from clubs like Lazio and Juventus showing a lot of interest. We have a great relationship with AC Milan. They bought a ton of our players, you know, from re-signing guys like Shevchenko, Bakayoko on loan, Giroud, Tomori, etc, etc. But if I was to give my thoughts and opinions, I ideally want to keep him. I mean, come on, you guys know I like him. I'm not going to be embarrassed by saying that I rate Loftus League, not at all. Um, there's one thing I think that is valuable about him and that's the fact that he has seniority now you know he's always been well respected well liked as well too and my thing is this yeah if you're building like a new club culture imagine what's happening when you're signing like 20 new guys that don't know each other that don't know the league that don't know anyone at the football club we can't just naively expect these guys to instantly come in form incredible team spirit and then be ready for us to start challenging front foot. It don't work like that. I feel like if you keep Ruben at least maybe maybe even one more season, you have a sense of like continuity then. There's a sense of like, okay, Ruben's a guy that's gonna make you settled in the country. You know, if you wanna find out where to live, 
what to do, need advice. You kind of want to turn to teammates to already know what the club's about, what it's always been about, and what the country's been about as well too. Like, he's the guy that helps transition the team spirit. And I feel like maybe people are dismissing this because, you know, it's so easy to just, like, look at footballers just, like, you know, how strong's my first team lineup and how good are the players and that's all you need to win when it's a lot deeper than that. And I think this guy has shown with how he's adapted his game to be like an offensive eight, to being a wing back, to being a DM, to being more of like a supportive guy in midfield, that he does have a place in the squads and he has been relied upon when he's used. And all the stuff about his final ball key passes, as if like anyone other than Enzo Fernandez has ever brought that consistency at all. As if they even make the attacking runs and have the attacking plays even encourage those types of passes. I just think that it's just seeing our situation from a very like myopic point of view and it's not seeing the bigger picture. But if he decides he wants to go and wants a new challenge, there's also great opportunities now for young midfields behind him. But I don't want to see these young guys now being misdeveloped like how Ruben was and others were over the past few years. So right now, my friends, that is the latest news today on the FC. This is Blue Lions TV. I'll catch you guys later with some more videos. Cool.